All right, open your Bible tonight to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16. I'll get used to this microphone by Sunday. Beautiful singing by Brother Opie, wasn't it? The only difference between my singing and his singing is he makes it sound uh, awfully simple, and I make it sound simply awful. Pretty close to each other, though, not much difference. Just depends on where you put the words. Well, you're a good crowd. You're better Christians than I am. If you had been preaching tonight, I would have stayed at home. So I appreciate you coming. I'm also amazed that you came. I'm always amazed when anybody comes back to hear me the second time, but I'm glad you're here tonight. I like to hear the rustling of those leaves, by the way. That sounds good when I give a text. As long as they don't ruffle too long, I get suspicious after a few minutes, so hurry up and find it. Mark 16, verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. I ought to stop a moment and say something about that verse. Uh, that does not make baptism essential to salvation. It just means when you're saved, you ought to be baptized. I lectured in a high school, and a high school student raised his hand and said, Now, doesn't the Bible say, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved? And I said, Yes, it does, son. But the remainder of the verse says, And he that believeth not shall be damned. I said, You see, believing is a determining factor, not being baptized. Then I said to him, That's like saying, He that getteth on the jet plane and setteth down shall fly to Jacksonville, Florida. But he that getteth not on the plane shall not fly to Jacksonville. I said, you see, son, it's the getting on that gets you. They're not the setting down. But any fool knows if you get on, you ought to set down. And if you don't set down, you wish you had to set down for the plain lights down. Verse 17. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Now let us pray. And our Heavenly Father, I want to be a blessing in this meeting. We only have two or three days. I really consider my time the most valuable possession I have. If I were laying now on deathbed about to die, I could not buy another hour if I had $10 million. And so when I give my time here, I'm giving my life. And so it's valuable to me. I want to be a blessing. And I pray that you'll make me a blessing tonight and use the sermon to motivate and inspire and instruct those who may be lax about soul winning, about getting busy and winning folks to Christ. Now use a message. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Notice with me tonight verse 15, verse 19, and the first part of verse 20. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So that after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere the Lord working with them. I want to speak tonight on the subject, Christ and his co-workers. Now, I left out verse 17 and 18 on purpose. I don't really have time to treat that verse or those verses. But you'll recognize this as the Great Commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The Great Commission is found five times in the New Testament. It's found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's also found in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where he said, But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Judea and Jerusalem and Samaria, and in the uttermost parts of the world, or even to the ends of the world. Five times Jesus says in essence, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, it's interesting to note that every time he gave the Great Commission, he gave a different promise. 
For instance, in Matthew, when he gave the Great Commission, he promised his presence. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. In Mark, when he gave the Great Commission, he simply promised his protection. In verse 17 and 18, he says, If they take up serpents, or if they drink deadly poison, it shall not hurt them. Now, he's not saying, do it. But he's saying, if you're out winning souls, taking the gospel to all the world, and in the process you get snake bit or happen to get fed some paws, and he said, it won't hurt you. You know, if, if for no other reason, I'd want to be a soul winner just to have the promise of that protection in those two verses. You know, there's a Bible example of a man on his way to Rome to preach the gospel. On board a ship as a prisoner, his name is Paul. The ship sinks, and he makes it to shore. And he's gathering sticks to build a fire, and a serpent comes out of the sticks and bites him. He shakes the serpent off in the fire and goes ahead and builds it. Those standing by thought he'd immediately die. They watched him, and they were surprised he didn't get sick, let alone die. You know why he didn't die? He was on his way to Rome to preach the gospel. And he had said in Romans chapter 1 that I'm a debtor. And he said, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. He promises his presence. He promises protection. In Luke, he promises the program. In John, he promises his peace. My peace give I unto you, not as the world giveth. And in Acts, when he gave the Great Commission, he promises his power. And here he says to them simply in verse 15, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. In verse 19, said, After he had spoken unto them, he was taken up into heaven and set on the right hand of the Father, our God, And verse 20, and they went forth and preached everywhere the Lord working with them. Two points. Christ and his co-workers, first, they worked. But I want you to notice five things about that. You'll notice, number one, they all worked. Everybody who heard the word back in verse 15, verse 20 says, went forth. It didn't say, and some of them, the more spiritual ones, went forth and preached everywhere. It didn't say, and the preachers and the deacons went forth and preached everywhere. It said, and they went forth and preached everywhere. They all worked. I should put a lot of emphasis on that. If we ever do evangelize the world, you'll evangelize it because you take the Bible program. And the Bible program is that everybody who's a Christian ought to be a soul winner. I've had people say to me, but God didn't call me to win souls. And I say... Soul winning is not a calling. Soul winning is a command, like tithing is a command, like thou shalt not steal is a command, like thou shalt not kill is a command. The command is go into all the world and preach the gospel. It's very clear. They all worked, every one of them. Nobody was excluded. You remember that woman at the well in John chapter 4? The disciples had gone to town to buy meat, and Jesus waited at the well, and a woman came by who had been married five times and was living with a man who wasn't her husband. Keep in mind, twelve independent, fundamental, Bible-believing preachers had been in town all day long fellowshipping and eating meat. And here was a woman at a well, been married five times, living with a man who wasn't her husband, had never heard Dr. Howell so in in lecture had never been to PCB and didn't know the Baptist Bible Fellowship from a wildcat. Here was a woman been married five times, never had been baptized, capsized, or salmonized, had never seen a set of tithing envelopes. She had never joined anybody's church. She didn't know a Bible verse. And when she got saved, she took off to town as hard as she could go. And when she got to town, she didn't even say John 3.16. She said, come see a man that told me all that ever I did. She didn't give the plan of salvation. Did you know she even exaggerated? The Lord didn't tell her everything she ever did. But you can forgive her. She was a woman, you know. Come see a man told me everything. You know, God overlooked her exaggeration, and many in the town believed on Christ because of her testimony. And the others didn't believe on her. Out of curiosity, followed her back to where Jesus was, and when he got out there... Those twelve independent, fundamental, Bible-believing preachers had been in town all day long. Did you know in that same town where she brought about a revival? Hadn't even been ordained. 
In that town where she got half the town saved, those independent fundamental preachers had not won one single soul to ta- of Christ in that town all day long. I'd rather have that woman as a member of my church and have all twelve of those preachers. Man, if I had her, I'd have had the old town my church next week, and, I, and those preachers only been twelve. If I'd have had them, they'd been fighting all the time. Come on now, wake up. They all worked. Every single one of them worked. Not all of them had a bus route. Not all had been to Bible college. Not all had a Sunday school class. But they all worked. Every one of them. You know what's wrong with the average church? It's like an ailing lung with only a few cells doing the breathing. There is not a business in the state of California that could operate with a percentage of absenteeism that every church had last Sunday morning. They'd have to close the business down. But it's only church, so we don't have to go if we don't want to. It's only missionaries we're supporting, so we don't have to give, and we don't have to sign a faith promise card. It's only missionaries, and they're only keeping people out of hell. That's not very important. Yes, it's very important. Amen. They all worked. Everybody. You say, well, I've just been saved a few weeks. You mean I ought to be a soul winner? I'm not but two weeks old in the Lord. Yes. When do you expect the candle to give light? When you first light or after it burns halfway down? When you first light it. I have found the most excited soul winners are those who just get saved. They have not heard that you can't do it. They don't know it's the last days. And they don't know we're in the gleaning stage. They think you can still get people saved. They just get them saved, get them saved, get them saved, get them saved. They all worked. Everybody. Every little kid. Every grown man. You say, but I'm old. I don't care. As long as you can talk, you ought to be a soul winner. Everybody. They all worked. Every one of them worked. During the Civil War, there's a man named Peter Apples. He wasn't a very good soldier. The story's in Gypsy Smith's book, entitled The Beauty of Jesus. Gypsy Smith said Peter Apples was out one day, and the superior officer said charge. And said they charged across the field and got under severe fire, and, and uh, the officer called him back. But Peter Apples didn't come back. He kept going. He ran through no man's land and down into the enemy territory and went down into a ditch where enemy soldiers were lined up like my fingers. And Peter Apples grabbed the first enemy soldier he could see and hit him two or three times with his fist, knocked him about half unconscious, then grabbed him up, drug him out of the ditch, and started dragging him back across the field. The enemy soldier took aim and started to fire, but every time they'd go to pull the trigger, their own man got in the way. Until Peter Apples drugged that man all the way back to his own superior officer and dropped him at the feet of the superior officer. The officer was stunned. He said to Peter Apples, where in the world did you get him? Peter Apples said, over yonder in the ditch. He said, there's plenty of them over there. He said, all of you could have had one if you wanted one. And on Sunday mornings, I feel like looking at a Sunday morning crowd and say, there's plenty of them out there and all of you could have one. If you really wanted one bad enough, you didn't win them. They all worked. You know why we haven't evangelized the world? And while I'm preaching to you right now, I said over to college this morning, if we could freeze the population of the world like it is tonight, so no one else was born and no one else died, and we won souls at the same rate we won them last year, it would take 320 years to win the United States of America to Christ. And it would take 4,000 years to win the world to Christ. But you can't freeze the population. You know why we're not doing it? We're depending on the preachers and the evangelists and a few spiritual Christians to do it when God expects every single person to be a soul winner, every one of them. Boy, I got angry one night in my church and preaching on soul winning. We had three medical doctors in the church when I pastored. I screamed and hollered one night and spit on the first eight rows and threw song books at them, did everything. I started to shoot them with a double-barrel shotgun, tell God they died with a chicken pox. I was so mad, I wanted to wake him up. I said, you doctors, every one of you. I said, you're letting people die and go to hell. And you know they're dying and going to hell. You're not even witnessing to them. I said, you're sorry, doctors, call yourself Christians. You're not Christians. If you are, you're not a good one. I screamed and hollered and spit and ranted and raved. And after the service, Dr. Mitchell came to me. He's a general practitioner. Dr. Mitchell said to me, he's kind of a fidgety guy. He rubbed his hands together. He said, Brother Curtis, I, I, I think that'll work, what you talked about. I said, I know it will, Doc. He said, I made up my mind while you was preaching that I'd, I'd witness to my first patient in the morning. I said, good, Doc, I'll pray for you. The next morning was Monday, and a man came in to get a physical examination. 
old doc gave him a physical examination. Then the guy got up on the table, was sitting there buttoning his shirt up, and Doc Demetrio went to the back of the office to read his soul in notes. He wanted to make sure he did it right. He said, now, old brother Curtis says, when you get ready to witness, don't ask him, is he saved? He won't know what that means. Don't ask him, is he a Christian? The best question to ask is, if you die today, do you know you'll go to heaven? And the guy just had a physical examination. He's sitting on the edge of the table, buttoning his shirt up, and Dr. Mitchell came out and said, <coughs> I got a question for you. The man buttoning his shirt up said, said Yeah, Doc, said, said, what is it? Dr. Mitchell said, uh, If you die today, do you know you'll go to heaven? That guy said, Oh, plow, and fainted cold as a cucumber. No, Dr. Mitchell got the smelling sauce and put it under his nose and brought him around. He said, Ah! He said, tell me it ain't that bad, Doc. I just came in to get a physical. <laughs> Doc said, man, you better calm down. You're going to have a heart attack. He said, oh, it's my heart. <laughs> Doc said, not a thing wrong with your heart, but you're too excited. <laughs> Finally, he got the man calmed down and said, listen, let me tell you what it's about. He said, my preacher said last night, everybody ought to be a soul winner. And he said, I'm a Christian. I let people come in here, and I never talk to him about the Lord and the he said, I, you're the first one I ever talked with. And he said, the preacher said, the question to ask is, if you die today, you know you'll go to heaven. He said, I didn't think how it would sound. The man said, you mean I'm all right? And Doc said, yeah. Next Sunday night, Dr. Mitchell came to see me. He said, Brother Curtis. I said, yeah, Doc, what is it? He said, you like to got me in bad trouble. <laughs> I said, what's that, Doc? He said, that question. I said, what question? He said, that you ask when you witness. If you die today, you know you'll go to heaven. I said, Doc, it's the best question in the world. I've been using it for years. He said, not for us doctors. <laughs> and I said, oh, me, tell me about it. What happened? He told me. He said, his man fell down in the office floor, fainted, said, I thought he died. I thought he had a heart attack. He said, it scared me so bad my chest began to hurt. I thought I was having a heart attack. He said, I was wondering how I was going to tell his family that he came in for a physical and I scared him to death in my office. Well, I said, Doc, did you want him to Christ? He said, just like that, just like that. They all worked, every one of them, everybody here. From the least kid to the oldest person, everybody ought to be a soul winner. Not only did they all work, but you'll notice, secondly, their work was aggressive. Look at verse 20. And they went forth. The emphasis today is on the gathered church. But in the book of Acts, the emphasis was upon the scattered church. And they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Somebody said, I don't like that buttonhole evangelism, that aggressive evangelism. I love it. I, I think I'm pretty wild about soul winning, but I, I got a friend of mine. He's crazier than I am. I mean, he's a nut. He and I was in a he and I was in a on a plane together and we got off in the airport in Atlanta, Georgia. We went in the men's room. In the men's room with all these stalls, you know. I guess they're in the ladies' room too, I just never been in there. <laughs> and you know what this idiot did? He reached in his pocket and pulled out a handful of tracks and went around and started throwing tracks under those stalls where you saw feet. He said, Read that while you're waiting, read that while you're waiting. <laughs> Embarrassed me so bad I run out of the bathroom out of the airport to get away from the nut. I, but I think maybe they looked down from heaven and smiled and said, Whoopee! I think up in heaven they kind of liked it, amen? If John Wesley was out of breath in pursuit of souls when he was here, I don't think he backstayed when he went to heaven, do you? Neither did Billy Sunday. They all worked. Their work was aggressive. Down in Florida, a little old preacher boy walked into a smoke-filled bar where there was pool tables. They was all playing pool and drinking. And this little preacher boy walked up to the meanest looking guy he could find. He looked up at him and said, uh, You think a Christian ain't got no guts? That big old guy looked down and said, No, I said a Christian ain't got no guts. That little boy said, uh, I'm a Christian. I got more guts than you have. That big old guy said, Yeah, prove it. He said, You hear that jukebox playing over there wide open? He said, If you got the guts to unplug that jukebox, I got the guts to climb on that pool table and preach a sermon. Big guy said, 
Yeah. He said, chicken. <laughs> Big guy said, I'll unplug it, I'll unplug it. And he went over and unplugged the jukebox. Everything got quiet. The little fellow jumped upon the pool table and opened his Bible to John 3, 16 and started preaching. The others got angry. They didn't know what was going on. They said, what's going on in here? And they began to cuss. Who unplugged the jukebox? By that time, the big guy felt proud of himself. He said, I unplugged the jukebox. And that's my buddy on the table. He's going to preach a sermon. Who, who wants to do something about it? <laughs> and man, he held him off while that fellow preached the sermon and gave an invitation that bar. Aggressive. Not only did they all work, their work was aggressive. I like it. I've only been witnessed to twice in my life. Twice. One was recently. I was on my way to Hollywood, Florida. And I always pray to get a seat. An aisle seat. I don't like the window. Once you fly two or three times, all the skies and clouds look alike. So I like an aisle seat there where you got plenty of elbow room. I pray that nobody will sit in the center next to me. And always, if it looks like the plane's going to be full with only two or three empty seats, instead of sit there and hope nobody will sit next to me, I take my Bible out and start reading out loud. That way nobody sits next to you. In fact, you can have the one next to the window too that way. Nobody will sit there with you. If it's two empty seats, it'll be next to you if you read your Bible out loud. So the plane was only about a third full, empty seats everywhere. I was on the way to, Hollywood, to Fort Lauderdale, Florida, to preach at Verl Ackerman's church, First Baptist in West Hollywood. I was sitting there minding my own business. I was a little tired. And this guy, about 25 years old, maybe, come walking down the aisle and looked at me. He sort of paused and looked at me and smiled. Well, I thought the man may know me. I ought to smile back. So I smile back. In a few minutes, he walked back up the aisle and came back down, looked at me again, smiled. I said, I said, uh-oh. But I said, if I don't smile this time, I'll be inconsistent. Maybe he knows me. He's embarrassed. Maybe, maybe he'll say something in a minute. So I said, I thought that was it. He walked up the aisle again, came back a third time. This time he stopped. I said, oh my goodness. I got a Lulu. He looked at me and smiled again, so I, I smiled. <laughs> then he looked at me and looked at the seat between me and the other man. He said, he said, is anybody sitting in that seat? I was so mad, I thought, oh, I was, I was burning. <laughs> I never have cussed in my life, but if somebody had cussed him, I would have said amen. <laughs> I thought, all them empty seats, all the plane, and I prayed to get a seat on an aisle with nobody next to me. And the seat's everywhere, and you want to know if somebody's in that seat. I was so mad. He said, anybody sitting in that seat? I said, I said, they all the awful small. I was mad. He started climbing over. Said, said could I sit there? I said, I said, I guess you, guess you can. He sat down. He tried to strike up a conversation. He said, uh, he said, where are you going? I said, same place you are. This is a nonstop plane to Fort Lauderdale, Florida. If you didn't know where it's going, you ought not have got on it. I was mad. He tried to talk some more. He said, what's your name? I said, Hudson. Man, I cut him short on everything. After a while, his face turned kind of red. It looked like he was about to cry. He said, mister, it looks like something's troubling you. <laughs> he said, did you know Jesus could take all your burdens? I said, oh. I write the soul in the column and the sword of the Lord. He's getting me saved. <laughs> I wanted to get out of the plane, man. I didn't know what to, I didn't know what to say. I, I said, uh, uh, tell me that again. <laughs> he said, I said, Jesus can take all your burdens. I later learned the guy hadn't been saved but a few weeks. He had just got up enough boldness to witness to his first person. I was his first one. And he was looking for a friendly face on the plane. Since I smiled, he thought I was a good candidate, and I turned out to be hard for him. <laughs> you know, I was embarrassed till I got I was saved, but I was afraid not to tell him. I was afraid when he came to Florida, he'd come to hear me preach. Maybe see an ad in the paper and say, I recognize that guy. I was sitting next to him on the plane. So I finally, I shamedly told him. I said, well, 
I didn't act much like a Christian, let alone a preacher, but I said, I am a preacher. I said, you kind of misjudged me, I guess, didn't you? Now, look at me. I said, I misjudged you, too. You wouldn't believe what I thought you was. <laughs> so let's call it even. What do you say? They all worked. Their work was aggressive. Notice, thirdly, their work was prompt. Verse 15, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Verse 19, He went back to heaven. Verse 20, And they went forth and preached everywhere. There's no hesitation. There's no delay. Their work was prompt. I have people say to me, You know, when, 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 I, when I retire, I'm going to give a lot of my time to soul in it. You ought to start doing it now. Yeah, when I get to, when, when all the kids are grown, my wife and I have more time, we're going to do, get more involved in the church. You ought to do it now. Yeah, their work was prompt. Do it now. Ari Torres said, uh, The wise man's day is today. The fool's day is tomorrow. Somebody else said, Yesterday's a canceled check. Tomorrow's a promissory note. Today's the only cash you have. Spend it wisely. Do it now. They all worked. Their work was aggressive. Their work was prompt. Notice number four. Their work was obedient. Verse 15, he said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Verse 20, And they went forth, and what's the next word? And preached. I love preaching. I don't know. I've heard all kinds of preaching. I was raised in an old semi-primitive Baptist church with a bunch of wind-sucking preachers. They even preached their announcements. They preached their prayers. I would show you what they did, but I'd scare you. I mean, they were wild, man. I mean, they had and uh, 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 when they preached like that. They'd say, and uh, do you take uh, this woman uh, who you hold uh, by the right hand? Uh, bless God. Uh, be lawful wedded wife. That's the way they preached. And they did their weddings like that. And if you didn't put it in there like that, they didn't. Th they thought, yeah, he's not preaching. But I never heard any preaching I didn't like as long as it was the Bible. Huh? Their work was obedient. They went forth and preached everywhere. That's it. Notice number five. Not only was did they all work, not only was their work aggressive, not only was their work prompt, not only was their work obedient, but number five, they did it everywhere. That's what it says. And they went forth and preached Everywhere. 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 I was coming home from Chicago, and I late one night, and I threw my bags down, and I said, uh, uh, check that for me, please, and I had him a ticket. He looked at my ticket and said, uh, is your final destination Atlanta? I was tired. I, I didn't want to argue with him. But I didn't, I didn't want to lie about it. I said, no, sir, my final destination is not Atlanta. Well, he said, there's been a bad mistake here then. I said, what do you mean? He said, this ticket says your final destination is Atlanta. I said, it would have been a bad mistake. Well, he said, I, I, we can correct this in just a few minutes. He said, where are you going? I said, Atlanta. He said, then if you're going to Atlanta, he said, your final destination is Atlanta. I said, no, sir. Well, he said, let me see if I can get this straight now. He said, do you live in Atlanta? I said, yes, sir. And when you get off the plane in Atlanta, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to get in my car and go home. That's where you're going tonight, to Atlanta. I said, yes, sir. He said, then you don't know it, but your final destination is Atlanta. I said, no, sir. You don't know it, but my final destination is not Atlanta. He got a little angry. He said, would you please tell me what your final destination is so I can check these bags? I said, heaven. He said, oh. I said, but don't check the bags. Just check them to Atlanta. He is tagging them. I said, what's your final destination? He looked up and said, well, it's not heaven. I said, I know what it is. It's hell. Don't have to be. I said, let me tell you how you'd make it heaven. And gave him the plan of salvation. He trusted Christ as his Savior and followed me halfway to the airplane and said, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. He said, you ought to tell everybody that. I said, I can't tell everybody. You tell some of them. He said, I'll do my best. Do my best. They worked everywhere. This story is circulated around the country. It happened several years ago. 
One Friday night, my wife had gone to Chattanooga to visit some kin folks. She had taken all the kids with her, and I was all alone at home. We weren't mad or anything. That was another time. <laughs> and when a wife and four kids are all gone, the house is noisy. I heard noises I'd never heard in the house before until she left. Squeaks. The kitchen sink leaking. Sound like Niagara Falls. Plunk. Plunk. I'd close the doors. I could still hear it. Bathroom. Looked like the water ever would get through running when you flushed it. I said, man, I couldn't sleep. I lay dead at midnight trying to go to sleep. I got to talking to myself. I said, self, go to sleep. When you don't sleep, your eyes look like road maps. Go to sleep. And then I'd hold my eyes too. And, and I, when I think I was about to sleep, I'd move my hands. They'd go click. Nearly one o'clock in the morning, I, I said, no use to be angry. I'll just get up and do something until I get sleepy. And I remember the man in my church named Hewlin who said to me, if you ever want to go soul winning any hour of the day or the night, call me. It was one o'clock in the morning, so I called Hewlin. I, he said, hello. I said, Hewlin? He said, yeah. I said, it's a preacher, Hewlin. Yeah, it's a preacher, what is I said, I'm going soul winning, Hewlin. He said, what time is it? I said, one o'clock. He said, in the morning? I said, in the morning. By then, he's woke good. He said, now, preacher, I never have tried to tell you what to do before. And I want to tell you tonight. But he said, if it's one o'clock in the morning, time you get here and we get somebody at the house, it's going to be two o'clock. He said, I don't think we ought to go soul winning no two o'clock in the morning. He said, we'll knock on somebody's door, and they wake up and stagger through the house. When they get to the door, we'll smile with our Bible in our hand, say, if you die, you know you're going to heaven, and said, he'll kill us. <laughs> I said, I'm going soul winning. You know, if you don't want to go, I'll go by myself. He said, no, if you go, I'm going. I'll cut part of the story out to make it shorter, so I went and picked him up. When I got to his house, he really thought I'd had a nervous breakdown or physical collapse or something. And he looked at me up one side and down the other. And then looked me right in the face and said, you're all right, aren't you? I said, I'm fine, Hewlin. I'm going soul winning. But he said, I don't think we ought to go. He said, people put bad dogs out in the yard at night. He said, we may not even get to the house. We'll be eaten alive by some dog before we get to the house. I said, I'm going. If you're not going, go on back to bed. He said, no, if you go, I'm going. In the meantime, I'd reached under my house and got a gasoline can with two gallons of gas in it that I'd keep my lawnmower for, for my lawnmower, put it in the trunk of the car. I started out North Wood Hills Road, and we drove a few minutes. And Hewlett said, where are we going? I said, you'll see in a minute. I got to 85 Expressway and hit the expressway and headed north toward Greenville, South Carolina. He said, where are we going? I said, you'll see. It suddenly dawned on him I may be going to South Carolina. He said, if you're going out of state, I said, I have to call my wife. I told her be back in a little while. I said, I'm not going out of state. I said, just sit where you are. You'll find out in a minute. In a few minutes, I saw a car parked on the right-hand side of the road. And a man behind it just sort of kicking around. I, I pulled up behind him, put my lights on bright, had a lot of light. I jumped out. I looked at the fellow. I said, say, sir, I said, you out of gas? He said, I sure am. I said, now, you won't believe this, but I've been looking for you for 20 minutes. And he looked at me like Hewlin looked at me. He said, you ain't looking for me, fella, for no 20 minutes. I said, yes, I am. He said, I don't know you. I said, I don't know you either. He said, then you're not looking for me. I said, I'm looking for a man out of gas. Is that you? He said, that's me. I went to the trunk of the car and got out a two-gallon gasoline can and said, uh, here's two gallons of gas. That'll get you to the next station. He took it and started to pour it in the car and had second thoughts and dropped it like a hot potato and jumped back and said, you pour it in. <laughs> so I opened the gas cap. I poured it in. He watched me with one eye and Hewlin with the other. When I got the gasoline in, put the cap back on, he said, well, I got it figured out. He said, you want $10 for that two gallons of gas. He said, you'll do that 10 or 15 times a night, you'll make a killing. Pull out a $10 bill and start handing it to me. Well, I really hadn't thought of that before I went over there. But it sounded like a good idea if he suggested it. I said, no, not $10. He said, well, 20 
pull out a $20 bill. He said, I'll give $20 to get my family off the expressway. I said, no, sir, not 20 He said, well, I can't give you any more than that. You have to take a hose and siphon it out. I said, no, sir. It's free. I paid it to give it. Paid for it to give it to you. You can't give me one penny for that gasoline. Well, he said, there must be some kind of catch about this. I said, no catch about it. I said, I'm just an old-fashioned gospel preacher. Couldn't sleep tonight. I remember giving out a gas on the expressway a number of times in big cities. And I knew here in Atlanta I'd find some folks on the expressway out of gasoline. I just thought I'd stop by and give them gasoline and then take the Bible and show them how to go to heaven. If you die, you know you're going to heaven. He said, no, sir. I said, would you give me just a few minutes let me show you how to know it? He said, yes, sir. He went and sat down in his automobile. He had a wife in the front seat, three kids in the back seat. I asked him, if you die, you know you'll go to heaven? No, sir. Three kids, no, sir. No, sir. And leaning through the window of his automobile on 85 Expressway at 2 o'clock in the morning, cars going by and my coattail blowing in the wind, I gave the plan of salvation. And all five of them trusted Christ as their Savior. He later wrote me from California, not to thank me for the gasoline, but to thank me for taking the Bible and showing him how to be saved. When I got the, they drove away, and me and Hudon were standing on the side of the expressway about 2.30 in the morning. In those days, I drove a little 60 Renault Dolphin. Uh, that's a car. <laughs> Second thoughts, it may not be. You don't get in it, you put it on. <laughs> Hewlin weighed about 265 pounds, and I'm pretty big myself, but he is bigger than I was. And he folded up like a full-bladed pocket knife and got in his side all wadded up, and I got in my side. And I put her in first gear and started off spitting and sputtering. Down the expressway. We hadn't been driving, but just a few blocks, and Hewlin began to get blessed. He started off by saying, <laughs> I looked over at him. He said, <laughs> I thought, oh, my goodness. And then after about two or three of those, <laughs> he shouted. I don't mean he said, praise the Lord. I don't mean he said, whoopee. I mean he shouted. Have you ever heard anybody shout? Have you ever heard a 265-pound man shout? In a six or an old dolphin? At 2.30 in the morning? Hang on now, I'll scare you. I'm going to show you what he did. He said, <laughs> And then he let her go. I never heard anything like it. He said, Whoa! and balled up both fists and began to beat my dashboard. He said, I never seen anything like it. The, the guy's lost his marbles. I thought it was about over with. He took a deep breath and said, Whoa! just kept spitting and hollering. I never saw anything like it. He shouted for about two miles. Now, you know something. I never had done that. But down in my heart, I want to do what he is doing. I said, Lord, I, I never have said, done that. I said, I, I'd like to do that. I said, it's not Sunday morning and nobody will ever know it. I said, he won't know it. I said, he don't know where he is. I said, he'll never know if I shout. I said, he's so high, he passed a flying nun three miles back. I said, Lord, I think I'm going to do it. And I loosened my tie, and I said, oh, little, little six, he was going, whoa! And I just got a deep breath and let out a rebel yell. I said, whoa! Glory to God! Whoa! And I spit all over my side the windshield. Now, when two guys are shouting in a six or an old doll fiend at two o'clock in the morning with the windows rolled up, the windows fog up real quick, just whew, like you're in a shower. And all of a sudden, I couldn't see where I was going. I was shouting. I looked up, and I thought I'd gone blind for a minute. And I reached up and rubbed a little hole in the fog so I could see where I was going. And we shouted for about eight miles. And then I saw a standard oil sign flashing on and off. And Hewlin was still going, whoop! I said, now, Hewlin. I said, hush, Hewlin. Whoop! I said, hush, Hewlin. I said, I said, I'm going to turn this service station and get some more gas. Now, hush. He said, whoop! I said, hush now. I said, if I pull in here to get gasoline, you go, whoop! I said, he'll call the police. I said, no way in the world to explain to that man what you're doing. If I say you're shouting, he said, yeah, I hear him shouting. 
I said, now you think you can hold it while I pull in here and get some gas? He said, I said, now hold it, okay? He said, and I turned my blinkers on and started in behind those gasoline pumps. And about the time I started to stop, he said, and I said, yo, and I went on through. I went three blocks up the road, and I said, you like to got me in trouble, Hewlett. I said, you think you can hold it this time? That's the only station open. I said, you think you can hold it this time? He said, that car was jumping. You're not going to believe it. I went back down, turned my blinkers on, started in. This time I didn't get behind the pumps. I just got started in the driveway. Good. This time he said, I said, oh, and went out the other side. You won't believe, you won't believe this. I made eight passes at that service station. Finally got in behind the pumps, and that guy, but he don't have any business 2.30 in the morning. It's kind of dead. He was about half asleep sitting at a desk and looking out like that. And he had seen this little black car eight times go, eight times he'd seen that. And he wasn't in a hurry to wait on us. I pulled it up there, and he was going, and the car was vibrating. And the guy came walking out, standing way back, trying to see through that hole in the fog. And I stuck my nose up and looked out at him. Then I opened the door and threw the can out and said, fill it up, close the door. He was going, and he could see the car vibrating, all that fog on the windows, and there's that little hole where I'd rub some fog away. He was trying to see through that hole in the fog and put gas in that can. He put about two gallons on the ground and finally got some in the can. And opened the door and took it right quick and closed the door and paid him. We hit the expressway. Before the sun came up the next morning, we led 18 people to Christ on that expressway. And when I let Hewlin out, he had shouted so much he had laryngitis. He said to me, God bless you, preacher. If you ever want to go soul winning again, any hour of the day or the night, call me. Ha, 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 ha. And I said, uh, I sure will, Hewlin. We had a time. Most fun I've ever had in my life. They all worked. Their work was aggressive. Their work was obedient. Their work was prompt. And they worked everywhere. But I want you to notice something else about the text, and I'll finish my sermon. And they went forth and preached everywhere, underline these next five words, the Lord working with them. That's exciting. You may work for President Carter, but you don't work with him. You may work for Governor Jerry Brown, but you don't work with him. But you don't work for God, you work with him. When you're out on that bus route, you're not there by yourself. Did you know I sense God's presence so close sometimes I find myself talking out loud to him as if he was sitting in the seat? It used to be embarrassing. I'd be riding along in the automobile talking to the Lord. I mean, just talking. Blah, 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 just talking. Lord, so and so and so and so, pull up at a red light. Not, not aware that nobody's looking. Then all of a sudden, I have this funny feeling. Somebody's staring at me. You've had those experiences. Blah, blah, blah. I said, Lord, so and so. Yeah, I'll be laughing. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Yesterday, 95 people saved. Amen. Woo, praise the Lord. I'm talking to the Lord. All of a sudden, I feel somebody's looking at me. And I look out the window. Here's a big old trailer truck. And I look up, and there's a guy. And I'm just talking, and I, he thinks I'm loony. And one day I saw a fellow going along with a telephone receiver in his hand talking in his automobile. And I didn't think he was crazy. I figured he must be really somebody. He's got a telephone in his car. So I took an old telephone, tore the receiver off of it, <laughs> tied it to my stern wheel, And when I got at a red light, I just picked that telephone up and said, Lord, this boy so was good yesterday, Lord. Amen. Thank God. Woo! Hallelujah. Amen. Guy looked down and said, I said, Praise the Lord. Just kept it on. He thought I was a big wheel. He wondered how I got that telephone that six or an old dolphin, though. 
the Lord work with them. I'm going to tell you something. You're talking about a stewardship emphasis. If you ask me, daughters, how do you get more money? I said, we're more people to Christ. All the money I ever got came through people I wanted to Christ. Jesus said, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. He said to Peter, when Peter couldn't pay his taxes, he said, you go down yonder and cast a hook into the sea. And there'll be a fish to bite it. And said, you pull that hook up. And when you get the fish out, he said, there'll be a coin in his mouth. Take the money out of the fish's mouth and go pay your taxes. That's a funny way to raise a budget. But it worked. I'm sure Peter went down there and he looked to see if anybody's looking. He was kind of embarrassed. It didn't say anything about putting a worm on the hook. It just said put a hook. But the Lord knows fish talk, so he talked to this fish. He said, As fish talk, for there's a Baptist preacher over yonder with a bare hook in the water. And he wants some money. He don't want to eat you. Go there where that ship sank, where that treasure box is open. Get your mouth full of money. Go there and bite that hook. When he pulls you up, he'll get the money out of your mouth and throw you back in. And I'll show you where the worms are and you can eat all you want. You said, now how you know the Lord said that to that fish? How you know he didn't? <laughs> how many fish did you ever catch on a bare hook with his mouth full of money? None. You know how to get money? Get people saved. Get people saved. Get people saved. I won my barber to Christ, Sam Barber. When I led Sam to Christ, started to leave the shop, he said, listen, before you leave, I've got something for you. He went to the back of the office a shop and wrote me a check, had it folded. He said, I don't have any children. I own this shop. My wife works. He said, I hadn't been to church in years. He said, I said, this is the Lord. He said, you take this. Put it in the church. When I got to the church, it was a check for $1,000. Two weeks later, I went back to get another haircut. He is cutting my hair. He said, I've been... I've been thinking about that check I gave you. I said, yeah, what about it? He said, it wasn't enough. When I left that time, he gave me another check for $1,000. Two weeks later, I went back to get another haircut. He's cutting my hair. He said, I've been thinking about them checks I gave you. I didn't tell him. I'd been thinking about them, too. I said, what about them? He said, it wasn't enough. Gave me another check for a thousand dollars. It got to where I was going back every other day to get a haircut. That's the reason I'm merely bald headed. He'd have to cut it all off. If he hadn't run out of money, I'd have been in a mess. Finally, he run out, and I went back to the two week schedule again. I, I had me a fish, had a coin in his mouth. I never told this story at my church. I tell it out, but never told it when I was pastoring. We bought a high school for our Christian high school. It was the old Avondale High School where my wife and I attended, where I met her. It has an eight and a half acre campus with the classroom buildings, lunchroom building, gymnasium, and athletic field. Beautiful place. When it came for sale and the old high school moved, I went up and made an offer to the people who owned it. I offered them two hundred and forty thousand dollars for it. And I said, we'll give you $6,000 earnest money, give you $34,000 at closing, that'll be forty, and you finance 200000 for 10 years, at, back then a very low rate of interest. And I said, providing the church approves it. And they said, okay, and they took me up. I went back to the church, told the church, and they accepted my offer. So I gave them $6,000 earnest money. Now, we set the closing about six months away, and that gave me time to raise the other thirty-four. But I got busy. And houses came for sale next to the church, and we bought up all the houses that came for sale. And all of a sudden, it was after Christmas. It was right at the end of the year, just before the first of the year. And it dawned on me that in January the 10th, I've got to have $34,000. I had just raised a $25,000 Christmas offering and some money for some other projects, and I didn't have the nerve to go out and tell the people I needed $34,000. I, I felt like I just drained them. I'm sitting in my office. It is after 5 o'clock. All the staff has gone home. I'm sitting at the desk feeling sorry for myself. And I said, Lord, I'm in a mess. I gave $6,000 earnest money on that high school prop property and promised 34000 at closing. And we close in 10 days and I don't have the money. 
I said, I can't go out to ask them folks any more money. I've got to have that money. I said, if I don't get it, we not only lose a high school property, but we also lose a $6,000 earnest money. I'm sitting in my office feeling sorry for myself. I did not make a phone call, did not write a letter. I'm sitting there feeling sorry for myself, thinking surely I'll lose the property when somebody knocks on my door after 5 o'clock. Startled me. I didn't know who it was. I just hollered, it's open, come in. And one of the men from the church opened the door and walked in. Standing in front of my desk, he said to me, I have some extra money I want to give here at the work church, and I just stopped by to leave it with you. He said, I've tithed, but this is some extra money. And he handed me a check and walked out. I opened the check. It was for $12,000. Well, I usually would get excited. In fact, I'd fog up some windows for that much. But I said, Lord, 12 from 34 is 22. I need 22 to go with this. Just kept sitting there. I hadn't been there 10 minutes looking at that check before I heard something else. I was so negative. I thought it was the same guy coming to ask for his check back. So I hid it under a book on my desk. And I said, it's open, come in. And it was another guy. He walked back and forth in front of my desk and said to me, this has been the best year I've ever had in my life. Made more money I've ever made in my life. He said, I've given a tithe and more. He said, I had some extra money here at the end of the year and wanted to put in the Lord's work. He said, I just sent Brother Olaf $5,000. My heart said, hmm. I was trying to be nice about it. I wanted to be happy, but I was mad. I thought, I led you to Christ and led your wife to Christ and all your kids and baptized your whole family. And I'm sitting here, and you don't know it. I'm sitting here praying for 22000 to go with this twelve, And you come in and tell me you give roll off $5,000. I said, I hope he chokes to death on his next glass of carrot juice. <laughs> then he smiled and said, I gave American missions to Greek 7000 I said, oh. Five and seven is twelve. I said, that's good. God wants the Greek saved too. I thought, terrible man. I said, Lord, it's a funny way to do me. I'm praying for $22,000 and this nuts coming by to tell me who all he gave his money to. Then he said, I sent so and so $10,000. I said, five and seven is twelve and ten is twenty-two. And 22 and 12 is 34, and that's what I need. I said, Lord, you supplied the needs, but this idiot didn't know where to put it. I began to figure out a way to write Roloff and the Greeks a letter and get the money back. I was going to say, Dear Brother Roloff, so and so sent you $5,000 before he prayed about it. And after praying, he now knows where it was supposed to go. And while I was trying to figure out a way to write roll off in the Greeks and get all that money back, he said to me, and I have something I want to give the church. And I thought, I'll bet you do. I bet you got a dollar. And he handed me a check and said, here, put this where you want to, anywhere in the work here, in the school or radio or television, anywhere you want to put it. Handed it to him and walked out. Opened it up when he left the office. $40,000. Four zero comma zero 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 period period. I said, Lord, I just kidding about roll off while ago. I said, I said, Shaw, bless old roll off, Amen. And God bless the Greeks. Woo! And I have fogged up some windows in. Forty thousand is hand, twelve in it. That's fifty two thousand. I only wanted thirty four. I'm sitting there stunned, holding two checks. Another knock. I cried. I said, no, you wouldn't do me that way. I said, Jesus, that'd be unfair. Don't you let him come back and say it's supposed to be four instead of 40. I said, I've done read both lines. It says F-O-R-T-Y, a thousand. I said, Lord, if it's that same man asking this check back, I'm going to lie to him. Now, if you want a lying Baptist preacher, just let it be that guy. Because I'm going to lie. I'm going to tell him I've dropped the night deposit and can't get it out. Then I said, it's open, come in. And another man come in. It wasn't either one of the two. He walked over and sat down in a chair in the corner of my office. He said, I heard you preach on your burden last Sunday. He said, I know the reason you don't do any more than what you do is you don't have the money. 
He said, I thought you might like to know that I've got $250,000 in a certain bank across town. He said, if you want it, you can have it. Any of it or all of it. I said, I wanted to believe what I was hearing, but I, 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 I couldn't believe anybody's had $250,000 want to give to the church. I said, I wanted to ask him to verify it. I wanted to be sure he said it right. When I worked at the post office, there was a little bitty skinny man there, so skinny and dried up, we nicknamed him Boy. He claimed he was hard of hearing in one ear. One day a guy said to him, Boy, loan me five dollars. Boy said, What would you say? He said, I said, Loan me ten dollars. He said, Say it again this five dollar year. <laughs> and I, I, I was afraid to ask him, I was afraid the figure would change, but I had to know. I said, 250000 I said, that's a quarter of a million dollars. And he said, yeah. He said, if you want it, you can have it, any of it, all of it. Turned and walked out of the office. Now, I never collected it. I did collect, I think, about 40000 one time. We had another project going. I, I collected about 18000 one time. But I never got all of it. He said, if you want it, if you need it, if you start a project and can't finish it, call me, I'll finish it out. That's twelve thousand and forty thousand and two hundred and fifty thousand. That's three hundred and two thousand dollars in twenty minutes. I was stunned, man. I hadn't called anybody, hadn't mailed out a letter. I'm just sitting there at my desk, stunned. I called my wife up on the phone. I said, I said Geraldine, that's her name, Geraldine. I said, It's Curtis. She said, Yeah, I recognize your voice. I said, honey, I'm be a little late for supper tonight. I said, just put my supper in the oven and keep it warm. We well, said, how late will you be? I said, I don't know how late I'll be. But I'm going to be late tonight. I said, I ain't got much time to talk to him. I'm expecting somebody that's knock on my door any minute now. I said, I got something going over here. I'm afraid to come home. May never come home. But I'll tell you, see, well, I said, I'll tell you about it tomorrow. I, I'm busy now. Hung up. I kept waiting for somebody to knock on the door. Five, ten minutes went by. Twenty minutes went by. Nobody knocked. Thirty minutes went by. Nobody knocked. Three hundred two thousand dollars. Finally, I got to playing like they were knocking. I said, I said, it's open. Come on in. And why don't you sit here where that man said it? Give us a quarter of a million. Five hundred thousand. Well, God bless you. I said, go tell your buddy I'll see him next. Man, I thought I'd knocked a hole in the sky and I couldn't plug it up. It was falling out fast and I could catch it. Scared me. I thought I'd ruin something. But nobody else knocked. God opened the faucet and poured out three hundred two thousand dollars and turned it off just like that. What one why did that? I'll tell you why he did it. He liked that 95 conversions or additions he was seeing every Sunday in that church. He liked the fact we'd baptize converts every week for over 14 years. He liked that. If you was God and you let your son die on a cross and suffer hell to keep, a, keep sinners out of hell, and there's a church in California getting a lot of people saved, and a bunch of other churches wasn't getting anybody saved, which one would you help? You'd help the one getting a lot of folks saved. They had to raise a budget. Get burdened about sinners. Go catch you a fish. Amen. And catch you another one. Catch you another one. You never know which one you're going to catch. If you would have told me when I caught two of those guys that one day they'd give me that much money, I wouldn't have believed you. But I was sure glad I did it. Old Carl Hatch, a buddy of mine, soul winner, had a brand new 98 Oldsmobile back down to several years ago. I mean, everything on it. Everything on it. I never seen a car so loaded. It was plush. I said, Carl, where'd you get that car? He said, uh, you won't believe it. I said, I want this Oldsmobile dealership just looking around one day. I said, I'm just looking at it. Just want, just look, just checking it out. He said, a man come walking out and said to me, he said, let me show you that car. I said, oh, no, I can never buy this car, man. Too much car for me. I can't buy this car. But he said, I'll tell you what do. Let me give you something. man said, what? Let me give you. He said, yeah, let me give you something. I said, what is it? Well, he says right here in this book. He said, he pulled his Bible out and gave the man the plan of salvation and won him to Christ. He said, he led him to Christ. He said, he stood there talking a few minutes. And he said to the guy, 
Well, I'll see you. And the man said, wait a minute. He said, now let me show you this car. Now you talk to me, now let me show you this car. Carl said, no, said, you can't sell me that car. Said, said, my father just gave it to me. He said, your father gave it to you? He said, yeah. He said, who is your father? He said, God. The man said, are you a preacher or something? He said, yes, I'm a preacher. I'm an evangelist. He said, if I gave you that car, do you have a non-profit corporation? He said, yeah. He said, can I write, write it off on tax? He said, yeah. He said, wait a minute. Went back there and brought out a bill of sale and signed it over to him. He drove that car off the showroom floor. He told me that, and I went down to Atlanta, the capital Cadillac place. <laughs> Want everybody down there to cross. Want all the mechanics, everybody out in the yard, and everybody up and down the street in the front of it. I never did get one. The Lord worked with them. And they went everywhere preaching the word of the Lord working with them. Tell you what you do here, boy. You put soul winning first. Get people saved. Get people saved. Get people saved. And God will put the angels on rations to take care of you down here. Amen. Stand together, please. And they went forth and preached everywhere the Lord working with them. Heads about eyes are closed, nobody's looking. How many would say to me tonight, Dr. Hudson, I'm saved. If I die, I know I'm going to heaven. Raise your hand real high and let me see it. Will you do it? Keep it up just a moment. You may put them down. Now, heads about eyes are closed, nobody's looking. Is there anybody who would say to me, Dr. Hudson, I couldn't raise my hand with the others? You may put your hands down. How many would say, I could not raise my hand with the others? I do not know if I die or go to heaven. But, sir, if you can know that when you die you're going to heaven, I want to know that before I die. That should be everybody who didn't raise your hand just then. Is there anybody here who would say to me, I don't know if I die I'm going to heaven, but want to know it before I die. Raise your hand real high and let me see it. Anybody like that? Anybody like that? I want to make my invitation appropriate with the sermon. How many will say to me, Dr. Hudson? I know somebody unsaved that I'd like to see saved before Sunday night. Before Sunday night. Raise your hand real high and let me see. I know somebody unsaved. I'd like to see them saved before Sunday night. Raise your hand. Keep it up. Keep it up just a moment. Now, I want you to think about that person. I want you to call their names over in your mind. Maybe a neighbor. Maybe some relatives. Maybe somebody you work with. I know somebody unsaved. I want to see them saved before Sunday night. Keep your hand up. Call the name out. Now, you can put your hands down. Now, here's the acid test. Sunday morning, I want us to have a big evangelistic service here. I preached to Christians the last two nights. I want you to work. I want you to make an all-out effort to bring that unsaved person you raised your hand about, either for the service tomorrow night or especially Sunday morning or Sunday night. I'll bring salvation sermons on Sunday morning and Sunday night. I want you to bring unsaved people by the scores. How many have said to me, Dr. Hudson, I promise God and I promise you that I'll do my very best to get that unsaved person here tomorrow night or Sunday morning or Sunday night. I'll go see them or I'll call them on the phone and I'll work at it. Raise your hand real high and let me see it. Would you do it? Just keep it up. Now you that have your hands up, how many are burdened enough that you'll come and just bow here at the front and claim that person for Christ while the organist plays softly and the pianist may join her through one verse? Any selection, without any singing. You that raise in your hands, come and just kneel and say, Lord, I'm going to visit Joe, or I'm going to visit Mrs. Smith, or I'm visiting June, or whatever her name is, or his name. And say, Lord, when I visit them, I pray they'll have open hearts and listen to me. And I'll be able to get them to come to church with me. And I pray they'll be saved before Sunday night. Come and kneel and claim that person for Christ, and we'll close the service that way. Would you do it? Come and kneel and claim that person for Christ. Dear Lord, give me so-and-so before Sunday night. I want to see him saved. Aunt, uncle, brother, sister, neighbor, friend. Lord, give me so-and-so before Sunday night. I'm going to go see him, Jesus. I'm going to go see him. I'm going to try to win him. Have him in the service. Have him in the service. Quickly, I'll wait for you. Just come and kneel and claim that person. Say, Jesus, give me so-and-so. I'm going to try to win him to you. Anyone else quickly have somebody you want to claim for Christ? Some neighbor? 
some relative. I want to come and pray for a certain friend of mine. I'm going to try to get them here before the meeting's over. And we'll try to win them. I'm thinking especially of Sunday morning. I want us to have a lot of people here on say Sunday morning. Now, how many that did not come forward would say, I know somebody unsaved, and I'll do my best to try to bring them to the service Sunday morning. I have a, somebody unsaved, a neighbor, a friend. You didn't come forward, but you'll try to bring an unsaved person Sunday morning. Raise your hand real high. Let me see it. How many? Yes, a number of you. God bless you. Yes. And now I'll pray for these who came. And our Heavenly Father, I pray now for these who came. Every one of them represent at least one soul for whom you died. And I pray tonight that you will burden their hearts in such a fashion that they cannot, cannot be happy until they get that person saved. I pray that you will prepare the hearts of those they're going to visit. And by the time Sunday gets here, I pray they'll have that person here when the invitation is given Sunday morning or Sunday night. I pray they'll come and trust Christ as Savior. Give us a great day with a lot of conversions and baptisms in the services. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.